Overcoming Fears. This is Aviator Cast, episode 113. Calling all aviators. You've landed at Aviator Cast, the top podcast resource for interviews, refreshers, lessons, training topics, and more. Join weekly and share in our passion for flying things, exploring the rare air through flight. And now, another episode pre flight complete, fuel on board, and flight plan filed. Let's kick the tires and light the fires. Here's your host, Chris Palmer. Welcome, 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 aviators. My name is Chris Palmer. No matter how long you've been flying, you are still learning. That may be at a slower learning curve than some, but a pilot is always and continually learning. If you aren't continually learning, then you're falling behind. Sometimes that means overcoming our fears with more training and polishing off those skills needed to be proficient in many areas. To this day, I still learn something new on every single flight that I take and try to internalize those lessons and learn those for myself and externalize those lessons and share those lessons with people like you here on Aviator Cast. So welcome to this, the 113th episode of Aviator Cast. Those of you that are viewing this on YouTube are going to see something new for the first time, and that is that you, uh, this podcast is now live. It's a live show on YouTube that I'm going to be doing um, hopefully weekly. And so there's a video component now to Aviator Cast. For those of you that have been listening to Aviator Cast for years as a podcast, it'll still be coming out in that form, but this is a, a completely new deal. And so as I'm figuring out the technology uh, going through this, I hope that you guys will bear with me because there are some little timing things that I still have to figure out, and hopefully the tech works out well. Um, got a lot of fancy things here, and I'm running the whole show myself, so it ends up uh, being a little complicated sometimes, and hopefully hopefully I don't miss anything. So as always, uh, Aviator Cast is brought to you by Aviator Training by Angle of Attack, offering online ground school wherever you are and flight training in Alaska. Get our Guide to the Sky video series with three hours of free getting started advice and steps. Turn your aviation passion into reality. Sign up today at aviatortraining.com. So this is going to be just a fairly quick and fun episode. Um, We're going to be getting into five pilot fears and how to overcome them. Just uh, some quick things that I've noticed people tend to get stuck on as pilots. Now, this isn't something that's going to be good for those that have a fear of flying. This is more for people that are already pilots and are having an issue getting over the hump on certain things. So uh, for those of you that haven't been to Aviator Cast before, uh, I'm a flight instructor. I have also some online ground school stuff that I do, and I just like to share my passion for aviation. I do that through kind of lessons or thoughts or opinions like you're going to see today. But I also do a whole lot of interviews with different people in the industry, whether they are instructors themselves or people in the military or airline pilots or bush pilots or regular everyday private pilots and everything in between. I like to get a lot of different perspectives from people all over the world. So um, one thing we do before we ever get into the meat and potatoes of an episode is we get into the... um, we get into a review for the show. So if you leave a review on the show uh, and share that on somewhere like iTunes, Stitcher, here on YouTube would be a good place, and I end up reading your review, then I will send you an Aviator Cast t-shirt. So I do this every week where I read a, re- a live review from somewhere out there, someone out there in the in the wild, someone that's been affected by the show and enjoys it, and then I read that on the show. If you hear your name, then you'll end up uh, sending me a message. And then I will send you a shirt. So this one comes from uh, Vinman72.19. I'm not sure what the decimal point there is from the USA. And he says, get inspired here. After 40 years of wondering if I should go for my PPL, I finally did it last month thanks to listening to the episodes of Angle of Attack for the past year. Many episodes are enjoyable to hear, but I've recently enjoyed listening to episode 105. John Schmiel's perspective was really insightful, and Chris's passion along with it really made it enjoyable. 
The videos of AOA, in my opinion, demonstrate how flying can be enjoyable with family and friends, whether if it's a visit to an interesting place, eat at a different restaurant, and enjoy friendships along the way. Keep on lighting the fires, Chris. I look forward to every episode. And that is thanks from Vin Carbonara in Lockport, Illinois. So Vin, I really appreciate your review. Um, It's, you know, everyone goes through these periods where they have an opportunity to get into aviation. And it sounds like you've been wanting to get into it for a long time and you finally had the the time, money, energy, whatever it was, all the, the planets aligned for you to be able to do that. So great job for uh, taking that window of opportunity and getting your license. Congratulations. Looks like you left that, uh, you left that review in November. So congratulations on now about six months or so of, of good flying. So I hope you're using that license and enjoying it and looking forward to maybe the next step, you know, what are you going to work on next? So go ahead and send me an email, me at aviatorcast.com, and I will line you up with one of those t-shirts. All right, so we are going to get into the main content of the episode now. We're going to get into five pilot fears and how to overcome them. So I will see you guys on the other side. All right, so I have several of these fears. Now, they're not all inherently scary or or something that all pilots have trouble with. I find that they're just something that mainly people get stuck on. So maybe they aren't so much fears as they are just uh, parts of aviation that pilots end up getting stuck on. So I'm going to go through several of these. I think this is going to be a little bit of a shorter episode. You know, this being the first YouTube um, live video today, I want to keep it a little simple. So we're going to go through each one of these and um, and see how you guys feel about them. So the first one is fear of landing. Okay, so how is it that we actually have a fear of landing? Well, I don't think it's necessarily a fear of landing as much as it is a fear of um of looking bad on the landing. So it seems to me that a lot of pilots, especially those in the airline industry, are judged on how they land as the ultimate mark of who they are as a pilot and if they are a good pilot. And so it's kind of interesting because you'll end up having this you know, 18 hour or 16 hour, whatever it is, it, these, some of these airliners can go so far these days, but let's just say it's even 10 hours. Okay. That's still astounding for hundreds of passengers to be able to travel from one part of the world to the next. Um, so you have this crew that manages this whole thing and, and gets you across the world, something we couldn't imagine in, in days prior. And on the other side, that pilot, you know, comes in and slams it down and, you know, maybe jolts the passengers awake a little bit, okay? And so there's this mentality that because the pilot did that, somehow they are a bad pilot. So it's just this thing, this uh, this landing thing, where, um, where we're just, we're judged on it, I think, way too much. So I think as pilots, we need to relax about our landings a little bit more, don't put so much emphasis on the fact that people will be judging us. So, you know, as, as an instructor, as someone that owns a flight school and someone that has to take great care of the one airplane that we have, I have a certain amount of tolerance for what I want my students to be able to do with the airplane. So while they may come in and they may drop it down and they may slam it down a little bit, I know that's still within the capabilities capabilities of the airplane as long as they've learned a lesson to move forward and make themselves a better pilot and maybe even self-evaluate a little bit on how they could have done that landing better. I care about that a lot more than I care about the perfectly smooth landing because even for me, you know, I want to look for a lot more than just a smooth landing with someone that has gone through a landing process. Okay. So I want to see that they set up their approach correctly. They were situationally aware about traffic in the area. 
They thought about, you know, gliding distance to the airport. They went through their checklist. They went through the different parts of their approach well, being downwind, base, and final. And then they hit their mark, okay? So there are many different things, many positive things that go into an approach and landing than just the touchdown itself. Now, of course, it is difficult for many to latch on to that final part of the landing where we are flaring and uh, dissipating our energy and touching down. But it is, uh, it is a process that, you know, just takes a lot of work. That is a feel thing that just takes a lot of work for students. And as an instructor, it's something that I have to explain differently and over and over and over again until they finally get it. And often because those moments are so So few and far between with the flare to landing, the flare to touchdown, um, often you really, as a student, can't fully understand what you've done until you review that on video or just go home and think about it a little bit more, debrief with the instructor. So I don't think in the learning process, even as, uh, as an instructor or as a professional pilot, we need to worry so much about are hard landings. So maybe this is a more appropriately named fear of hard landings, but um, there's just a lot more there that I think we should be aware of than just those, okay? So that is number one. Number two is fear of confined airports. So this is an interesting one because uh, around here in Alaska, we deal with a lot of smaller airports that um, that to some would seem fairly advanced. So, you know, imagine going into an airport where there are trees on all sides, the airport is relatively short, and you have, um, you have uh, maybe some wind issues or, or other things adding to the challenge of where you are flying. And you start to see why people would have issues with that, especially if you haven't been around it too much. And so when I learned to fly, I learned to fly, which is very typical for many. I learned to fly on a big, long runway. It was a concrete runway. And while I went to a couple shorter airfields and never went to somewhere truly short and uh, just never got to practice those things as a pilot, like soft takeoffs and landings or, um, or short takeoffs and landings in an actual real world scenario, especially at a place like a confined airport. So again, the the definition of a confined airport would be terrain around it, trees around it, whatever it is, just small and tight and your numbers and everything have to be right on the ball. So I find that the, the thing that really has to be done to overcome this is simply training and experience. So while many of you won't have the opportunity to fly at airports like this in the very beginning of your training. I hope you do, but it seems like that's not the norm. Uh, When you're done with your private pilot license, then, you know, these are some of the things you can start to add on to your repertoire. You can start to go to an instructor that's experienced with this type of stuff and say, Hey, I want to go to this airstrip and I want to, I want to fly in here and learn how to do it. And I want to go here and learn how to do that. You know, it's good to have someone along with you when you do those things for the first time, so you can learn some of the intricacies of how to do that. Now, it's true that a lot of the the components of how you do short takeoffs and landings by the book um, are still absolutely relevant when you go and do it in the real world. But it's a much different thing when you've practiced at a big runway, you've done all those things at a big runway, you took your private pilot test on a big runway and prove that you could do those soft takeoffs and landings and then have to go and do them in an actual place where you're facing those challenges. Uh, The more experience I get, especially around here, um, the more I realize that I have to be aware of the, uh, maybe the outlying uh, things I need to be aware of. So it's not so much the distance of the field or the temperature or the trees or the performance. Of course, flat out, I mean, all those are things that we absolutely take care of in the first place, right? But it's the things that aren't commonly talked about in, in pilot training, which would be something like 
How are the winds going to act in this airport? Have you talked to local pilots that really understand the intricacies of how the wind acts at certain angles at this airport? Um, maybe some techniques that people use that are a little bit different, but tend to get you uh, get you where you need to go. We get a little part of that culture up here in Alaska where, you know, people, people fly differently and they have these, they have these, um, techniques and things that they've used for many years that work quite well. Now that's not to say you should be doing anything dangerous. It's not saying that it's just saying, Hey, go beyond just what the book says and learn from those that are really experienced and go and fly with them at these places. And so you can overcome that fear of being at these confined airports, going to these soft or short trips, Maybe it's everything combined. Maybe it's confined, soft, and short, and uh, and learn from those people. What you're going to find is that they are thinking a whole lot ahead of time on what the conditions are and 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 you know what to do in certain situations. So there's an airport here nearby that I go to that I tend to get some information on it before I even go. I ask the local pilots how it is because I am taking a student to that airport and I want it to be an experience for them that is pleasant in the sense that we're actually going to accomplish a learning goal rather than just, you know, fighting dangerous winds and and things like that. So um, I would say that overcoming the fear of confined airports is, um, is something that is overcome with simply more experience and flying with those that are more experienced than you are. Okay, so that's number two. Number three is fear of stalls. Now, this is something that I actually see quite a bit is a fear of stalls. So we've all been there in the very beginning of our training where this term, just the term stall, which is often confused with stalling an engine, um, is, is something that people get hung up on and they get a little scared. So I think, I think, for me, I also had this fear in the very beginning when I was a, a private pilot trainee. So I just, I didn't know how to control the airplane very effectively or quickly at that point. And I had these fears in the back of my head of a stall developing into a spin and that happening at the wrong time. And so I, I think that there are some things that we should be thinking about in terms of stalls. First of all, one of the best times to practice stalls if you've been a pilot for a while and haven't practiced them in a while, is to do that during your required uh, flight review, which is every two years, every 24 calendar months, and go and practice those with your instructor. So this is a good time to be with someone that that does stalls often because they have to for pilot training and and glean some things from um, from them and get a little bit more comfortable with it. The point when I got really comfortable with stalls, and and this is another thing to think about, is when I did spin training. So as a a flight instructor, you are required to get an endorsement, a spin training endorsement that says that you've done that sort of training because you're going to be with students and you could potentially get into spins with students. So when I went up and did spin training, we had two different 172s that we tried to use. The first 172 we tried to use, we could not get into a spin. We tried about six or seven times. We could not get the thing into a spin and uh, it would just recover from the stall right away before it would develop into a spin. So that alone gave me a lot of comfort because we were doing everything wrong. We had full power. We were pulling the nose back. We were doing full opposite aileron and rudder and it just wasn't going. Then we tried in a different airplane and we were able to get it over the edge. They were both 172s. Maybe one is just rigged a little bit different, but we were able to get the other one over the edge and develop it into a spin. So a couple caveats to that. Um, The reason why I became so comfortable with stalls at that point or more comfortable with stalls is because I saw truly how difficult it was to get something into a spin in the first place. And I a lot of things had to go wrong for a long time before a spin could develop. Now, that's not to say that there aren't certain combinations of things within a flight that could creep up on you and could uh, cause a stall spin accident when you're um, maybe not aware. 
And we as instructors have been kind of grilled on that the last several years in the sense of the base to final turn and some other locations where a stall spin is is uh, more likely or has been more likely in uh, in in accident reports. So with all that said, uh, I, I just I felt more comfortable because I saw how difficult it was to get the thing into a spin. And I saw that it was also as part of that pilot induced for the most part. OK, so when I teach stalls myself, I first teach the student before I teach them the the rapid fire stall recovery technique is I show them that you can literally let go of the airplane in most cases, and it will by itself recover from the stall. So it's a wing, doesn't matter how great of avionics you have, doesn't matter how nice everything is in the airplane, doesn't matter how new it is, has a wing, and that wing wants to fly again. You'll notice that when you do a stall, in most cases, and, and I'm sure it's not the case for all airplanes because airplanes are designed differently, but if you simply let go, it will recover from the stall, okay? So that is that is prevalent in the types of stalls that we commonly practice. There are some a few outliers um, that, that wouldn't be the case, things like uh, a CG load lift and things like that where that's more of an outlier discussion. But um, so this, this fear of stalls for me has gone away because I've practiced, I've kept learning, I've kept moving forward, and I've learned that it's, really the pilot that is doing it at the end of the day. So uh, this is why I teach so much about energy flying, about flying angle of attack, about um, attitude flying, rather than just looking at the airspeed. I like my students to feel and hear and smell in certain cases what the airplane is doing. So uh, kind of a cool thing you can try next time you go and do stalls is because it's so quiet, especially during, say, a power off stall or an approach to landing stall, you're emulating that approach to landing, is actually pull your headset off for the stall and hear the air going past the wings and how everything is working. Okay, You're going to notice these little wisps of sound and these little whistles that will give you an indication of the stall. You're going to notice things on your fingertips as you're holding the yoke or the stick on how that airplane is controlling and, and the, the precursors to a stall that you are getting. So that's going to get you much more familiar and intimate with your airplane. So practice, practice, practice. That's how to overcome um, the fear of stalls. Of course, as pilots in everyday operations, we're not intending on getting in stalls. That's not a normal thing. The, the only normal point in which we're really getting into a stall, and this isn't even the case in all airplanes, is upon landing. So when you are landing a Cessna, for example, it's a full, you know, you want to get to a stall. You want to hear that stall horn chirp in some cases, and in some cases not. And then in some low wing airplanes, you actually never hear the stall warning horn when you're landing. So it just depends. So I'm not saying or advocating to go out there and, you know, go do a bunch of stalls and get familiar with them, even though I'm not saying also that it's not inherently dangerous to do so. But what I am saying is that you're going to learn your airplane a lot better and learn the importance on why we're trying to avoid stalls in the first place if you get familiar and, and get that intimate feel with your airplane um, with some of those techniques that I talked about, like taking off your headset and, and feeling and hearing and smelling and, and all that stuff, how, uh, how things, uh, are working. Okay. So that is the fear of stalls. So now, um, this one is more about communication. So the fear of sounding stupid. So this is, uh, this is something that I think every pilot faces now and again. Um, I think for me, now that I've been, uh, been a pilot for a good number of years now. I'm to the point now where I don't really care if I sound stupid on the radio. I, I kind of assume that there's going to be a point in which I will sound stupid because I, you know, I just, I'm human. I, I fumbled my words and I said something wrong or got something mixed up. Um, and, and I just have to realize that, that 
And I think that it's important for you to realize too, is there's not someone on the other side of the radio with a big switch. that's just going to whack you if you say something wrong. Okay. It's going to be embarrassing more to yourself than anybody. You know, even your instructor isn't going to be um, embarrassed for you. So outside of um, doing really foolish things like uh, declaring an emergency when you shouldn't or, or for your own convenience or something um, and just other other things you shouldn't be doing on the radio. And, you know, we're, we're talking about being professional here. Uh, don't worry about the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff because at the end of the day, you're not going to learn how to speak well on the radio. If you don't just allow yourself to think through it, you know, I, I, every now and again, I see these threads pop up on some Facebook, uh, Facebook groups or forums or different places that are railing on pilots for saying certain things on the radio. Okay. Um, one of them is, uh, November two, four, two, three, and inform with you on one twenty three point three at 4,000. So people will say, well, you shouldn't say with you. Of course they know that they're with you, you know, you're with them. Um, and then there's other complaints about, uh, checking on or saying, uh, fish finder or all these different things that are, kind of fun and conversational in the national, uh, air traffic system, national airspace system. So I don't know. I, you know, I, I think that we, we have to be professional in our speech. We have to try to clean up our speech, but then there are those times, especially in a local uncontrolled area when you just got to talk it out with somebody on the radio. Okay. There's no short form. You just got to, you know, figure out what you're both doing because, Someone's on a collision course and you, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta arrange things. So there are times to be professional and succinct, um, especially when things are busy on the radio and there are times to just talk it out and get it done. There are times to, uh, you know, say hello to a friend on the radio you haven't heard from for a long time, or maybe, you know, it's their first flight back after several years and you want to give them a, a, Hey, good job sort of thing. Okay. So I don't know. I I think that we all need to settle down a little bit about sounding stupid on the radio and, you know, work to that professional level by practice and, um, and treat the radio with respect, but also don't treat it like, uh, like there's, um, someone on the other end that's going to hurt us if we don't, uh, if we don't say things correctly. Okay. So that is my little spiel. I have a feeling that with all that, some of you could disagree with me on some of those things, but that's what it is anyway. All right. So that is something on radio communication. Now is the fear of failing. So, you know, I I think this one is going to be a lot more common with those that are not quite pilots yet, rather than those that are pilots. But I think that this can also happen with those that are currently, um, pilots and looking to maybe get the next rating, go to the next step. And so they are, um, they're kind of working toward that and not sure if they can really make it. And, you know, our own worst enemy, that devil on our shoulder tells us that we can't do it, that we don't have enough time. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough support from those around us and that we're just going to fail if we go toward our dreams. So this one is a little bit more, I guess, touchy feely in the sense that, um, you know, there are many things I think that try to get in our way naturally in our lives as part of the way the universe or energy or something works. Okay. Some of you may even get into religious terms there. There's some op opposing force rather opposing force that tries to prevent us from becoming our best selves and, those things that speak to our mind give us this fear that, you know, we can't do that. We're not worthy of doing that. Um, we don't have enough time or money. Again, those are some of the things that always come up when people are looking to do this and you know, that it couldn't possibly be me. It couldn't possibly be me that could, uh, could get a cool flying job and could do something I really love for a living. So I think that there are those forces out there sometimes they're even very apparent in front of us that in very rare cases, it can be family that uh, try to prevent us or disparage us from flying. Um, There are forces out there that are trying to prevent us from becoming our best selves, from pursuing something like a passion for aviation that you may have. And maybe, you know, maybe you 
kind of want to do this as a hobby, but maybe there's something else, you know, you really want to do. I think, you know, this isn't just an aviation thing. This is an overall, you know, getting to the next step in your life, achieving your dream sort of thing is, uh, is getting over this fear of failing. So I've had those times in the past in aviation, you know, I've had times where it was easy for me and I've had times where it was very difficult for me to move to the next step. What I found is that in order to stay in aviation, to stay active, to keep flying, to keep enjoying this freedom, to keep enjoying this passion, to keep sharing in the many, many wonderful positive things of aviation, there are things that I have to do and, and uncomfortable things I have to go through in order to, to keep that in place. And so one of those things is just the the nature of what the FAA requires us to do to stay active as pilots. You know, we have to do a certain amount of training. Um, we have to do a medical. We have to do uh, different things that cost time and money and effort. And it's not really easy staying in aviation. You know, it's much easier to say, oh, I don't have time or money for that right now. I'm just going to kind of fall out of it. And if you're doing it really well, then you need to be doing it a lot more often than the FAA requires. And so first off, it is really hard just to stay in it. Um, but all that said, you know, with all those difficult things to do, I find that when I'm in a place of minor discomfort and I'm getting things done and I'm still flying and I'm still moving forward, you know, things are good. I feel like I'm living on purpose and doing what I should be doing, even though I may not be getting the biggest paycheck in the world, even though I may not have all the time in the world, even though uh, it's exhausting and time consuming and all those things, it's still what I feel like I should be going, uh, should be doing. So there's a, like a level of discomfort there where of course the most comfortable thing is to sit back and not do anything and not try. Right. But to be in it and trade that small amount of discomfort for the amazing experiences that I get to have as a pilot is definitely worth it. So um, I think if we can, all of us take on that certain level of discomfort to staying in it and, and keep going, then we get those blessings. We get those experiences. We get those things in aviation that are just so wonderful. And, and even just being part of a community, there's so many positives to it. So that is uh, that is my spiel there on the fear of failing. So I hope you have a couple good and positive thoughts on that one. I know that one is a little bit more touchy feely for you. Okay, so I know that this one was short. Looks like we're just over a half hour, but I wanted to test some of the things here I had technology wise and get a podcast out before things got too crazy again. You know, always moving forward, always taking that next step and thought I'd do this podcast. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Look forward to seeing your comments here on YouTube and look forward to seeing your comments on the podcast too. And we're going to have a couple closing messages here and then we will, uh, I'll have some closing thoughts at the very end. So let's now get into that. Join us next week for another exciting topic or interview with a great guest. All Aviator Cast resources can be found at aviatorcast.com. Subscribe to AviatorCast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, and other podcast services. Did you enjoy the show? Review AviatorCast on iTunes or similar service. If your review is aired on the show, we'll send you an official AviatorCast t-shirt. As always, we'd love to hear from you. Write AviatorCast at me at aviatorcast.com to introduce yourself or to ask any questions you may have about aviation. Now for the final release clearance, back to Chris Palmer. All right, guys, thanks for joining on this episode of Aviator Cast. Um, I know it was a short one, but uh, it's it's a lot of things kind of moving around here again to get the show going today. So I'd love to hear your comments. How did you like the the video version of this? How was the audio version of this still? For those of you that are longtime podcast listeners, I'd really like to hear that. Um, lots of good things coming up for me. You know, I have some full-time students coming here to learn, uh, to get their licenses here in the next several months and really looking forward to that. Uh, I just got done with my CFII. We're trying to upgrade our airplane. Lots of things are busy. The weather's nice, you know, new and, and great and even repeated experiences that we get to have around here with everything turning green and staying warm again. Um, I'm looking forward to flying at midnight with the sun still up. So that's going to be pretty fun here coming up soon. 
So I don't know. It, it's a good positive time. I'm feeling good about where I'm at in aviation. I really hope that you are feeling the same way. You know, going back to everything we talked about today with a lot of these fears for flying, I think it's really important that we're just always moving forward. We're always trying to find that next step in aviation, no matter where we are, to grow and improve and become a better us, a better pilot, or and a better person and a better aviator, whatever you want to, whatever you want to do. Um, but you know, I, I find that for me, I gain a lot of value in the teaching of aviation and in sharing in the community. And I just enjoy that so much. Um, even surprisingly for me, I, I can't fly like all day long. Like I don't get much out of flying solo. Even, uh, I like to be with others, experience it with others, do videos, do photography, share in the passion. And that's what it is about for me. And I hope that you can find what it's about for you too and take those next steps to, toward getting there. Now, a couple of things that, that I can help you out with in terms of that is the Guide to the Sky, which I mentioned earlier. Guide to the Sky is a three-part video series I did. Talks a lot about the medical and step-by-step -step process of what it takes to get a pilot's license because I think a lot of those processes are complicated for people. They don't quite know how to even approach a flight school and talk about doing this, let alone what the steps are to actually achieving that license. So I run through those in that series. That's free at aviatortraining.com. You can check that out. And if you're already in the market for a ground school, I have currently a private pilot ground school that you can enroll in on aviatortraining.com. And also I'm building right now, that's my main, uh, my main goal right now is building an instrument ground school. And then later on, I'll be doing a commercial ground school. So soon enough, aviator training and angle of attack will have a full uh, breadth of the, the basic ratings that you need to get up through the commercial rating and you can get all those online. So that is it for me. Really appreciate what you guys do. Again, keep taking that, uh, that next step forward and, um, and you will get there. So until next time, throttle on. <laughs>